going to be number four. It's a forest plant growing in the understories. Everyone knows what a flower looks like. It's a classic piece of nature. But wait, as we know, nature doesn't always play by the rules. Sometimes, in fact, Mother Nature gets experimental and creates some truly amazing and unexpected species. These strange flowers take the cake when it comes to doppelganger statues. You might confuse some of these flowers for an alien or even a monkey, and that's just the top of our list. Stay tuned for 20 unusual flowers that look like something else. <sighs> Number 20, Hyde Nora Africana. This flower belongs to Hydnora africana, a resident of Southern Africa's deserts. Kind of looks like an extraterrestrial visitor, doesn't it? What makes this plant stand out is its lack of roots, leaves, and chlorophyll. Plus, it's mostly an underground dweller, only showing its face or flower to the world above. You could call it an underground vampire. It's got suckers on its stem that latch onto the roots of Euphorbia maritonica, a nearby shrub to draw nutrients. Above ground, all you'd spot is its flower bud, which eventually grows and blossoms into an eye-catching pink bloom. Give it a year in the right conditions, and that bud will be a full-blown flower. But the flower emits this powerful scent, reminiscent of decaying meat. That's usually how most folks come across it. That scent is a magnet for carrion flies and dung beetles. Given the odor and the flower's bright pink color, these insects might mistake it for a creature. As they wander into the flower, the edges curl in, acting like a temporary barrier. Inside, the flower's surface is slick, allowing these little creatures to slide around. But it's not all a trap. After they've done their job of pollinating, the plant gives them an exit, and they're free to leave. Isn't that nice? If you love both flowers and aliens, then you should subscribe right away, because we have tons more content in store. And if you love funny shaped flowers, give us a like and let us know how we're doing. Number 19, monkey face orchid. How on earth did this orchid end up looking like a monkey? Did it come from some science experiment? Did a bunch of scientists in lab coats decide, hey, let's make an orchid with a monkey face and then mess around with its genes? I need to know. Well, this flower known as the Dracula simia orchid or simply the monkey faced Dracula orchid, as I prefer it to be called wasn't cooked up in a lab by orchid and monkey enthusiast scientists run amok. Believe it or not, this unique flower grows naturally out there. You can see the um, eyes and the nose. It's found specifically in the cloud forests of Peru and southeastern Ecuador. Plus, they prefer high altitudes, growing only at heights above 1,000 meters. While it can bloom anytime, it's a bit finicky about its preferred conditions. The Dracula in its name is about the two long sepals at the base of its petals that shelter the budding flower. And the center? Well, it does resemble a monkey's face, period, which gives the orchid its quirky appearance. But beyond its looks, the scent is another surprise. When it blooms, this orchid emits a fragrance similar to ripe oranges. It can blossom in any season. So appearance or aroma, which wins you over? Number 18, Naked Man Orchid. Orchis Italica. Can you wrap your head around the idea of an orchid that looks like a tiny naked man? Well, this particular orchid does. The shape of its petals mimics a man's limbs and even his, well, private parts. <laughs> Plus, if you look closely, the patterns seem like a smiling face with two little eyes. The way these flowers bunch together gives the impression of several of these men dangling, hence the nickname Hanging Naked Man Orchid. Its official name is Orchis Italica, and it belongs to the Orchidaceae family. Some people even call it the Italian orchid. Its native regions include places like Jordan, Turkey, Italy, and various Mediterranean countries. An intriguing tidbit about this orchid is that it contains both male and female reproductive parts, which is kind of ironic given its appearance. So both genders are represented in one flower, kind of like I believe in all of us. Insects play a crucial role in their pollination. Some hybrids of this species have broader petals that sort of resemble a hood or helmet. Historically, people believe that if a plant resembled a body part, consuming it could benefit that particular organ. Given this orchid's striking resemblance to a male's reproductive system, it's been traditionally used to treat virility issues since the Roman Empire. It was even thought to enhance one's appeal in the romance department. 
Number 17, Hooker's Lips, Psychotria Elata. Check out the Psychotria Elata, better known as Hooker's Lips, or the Hot Lips plant. Why the cheeky name? Its stinking red bracts totally resemble a set of lips, although it looks like something from a graphic design project. Believe me, it's 100% natural. This unique plant can be found in the tropical rainforests of Central and South American nations like Colombia, Costa Rica, Panama, and Ecuador. Evolution sculpted its shape to woo pollinators like hummingbirds and butterflies, but this gorgeous hooker lips plant is on the verge of becoming a memory due to rampant deforestation in its home countries. If smooching with nature is on your bucket list, find a hot lips plant and pucker up, but be quick about it, those bracts don't stay kissable for long. They soon open up to reveal the actual flowers. And there's more to this plant than just its <laughs> dazzling good looks. Traditional remedies lean on the bark and leaves of P. elata to combat earaches, coughs, and skin issues. The Guna folks in Panama and Colombia have sworn by this plant to alleviate shortness of breath for ages. And in Nicaragua, the entire plant's been a favorite remedy for snake bites. Number 16, Snapdragon Seed Pod, Antirinum. Snapdragons are charming flowers. Reminders of days gone by. Their blooms resemble tiny dragon jaws that, when pinched gently, appear to open and close. While honeybees don't quite have the muscle to pry open these floral jaws, robust bumblebees are up for the task, ensuring that the flowers get pollinated. As the pollination blooms fade away, snapdragon seed heads offer another layer of mystery. Once the flowers wilt, what remains are dried seed pods. These have an uncanny resemblance to miniature browned skulls. Showing yet another facet of nature's weird and wild, wonderful side. Come late summer, if you spot these seed pods, you might want to snap a photo. It's a sight some friends might find hard to believe. These peculiar seed heads have inspired myths. Old tales say that women who eat these skull-like seed heads could regain their youth and beauty. Number 15, Happy Alien, Calceolaria uniflora. The happy alien plant is something else, I tell you. It's named that way because its flowers, well, they look like little aliens. Beside its cool appearance, it's a rare find. In fact, it only grows naturally in one specific spot worldwide. But thanks to human intervention, you can now find it in areas of Chile and Argentina, though it remains quite elusive. Charles Darwin himself gets the credit for its official discovery during his expedition between 1831 and 1836, but notes about this plant go way back to 1791. The technical name for this interesting specimen is Calceolaria uniflora. Keeping it low, it grows about four to five inches tall, a trait that it shares with many alpine plants. Its flowers are fascinating pouch-like structures that sprout from a base of tiny tongue-like leaves. They're mainly a bright or ink yellow with varying levels of deep red freckles. And there's a white stripe across the flower's mouth with burgundy accents around it. This white part is a real buffet for a particular bird species. As the bird nibbles away, it unwittingly gets pollen on its head and helps in pollinating other flowers it visits. Number 14, Darth Vader, Aristolochia salvadorensis. The Darth Vader flower, also known as Aristolochia salvadorensis. Looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Well, Star Wars, who are we joking? To be precise, but it's a very real and native species to Central and South America, and it thrives in the balmy rainforests of countries like Brazil, Guatemala, and El Salvador. A part of the Aristolochisae, or birthwort family. That's a new one for me. It's one among roughly 500 species, with many of them having a toxic nature. Living in challenging conditions, this plant had to get creative to survive. Those startling white eyes are crafty traps for unsuspecting pollinators. Tiny sticky hairs ensnare these guests until they've gathered enough pollen to spread the plant's seeds far and wide. And to boost its allure, it gives off a smell reminiscent of, you guessed it, a rotting body. A scent certain pollinators can't resist, <laughs> myself not included, However, the flower's bloom is fleeting, making it even more mysterious. Their bloom lasts for just about a week, reaching up to two inches in height, and then they begin their descent. If you're thinking of adding this plant to your garden, 
you may want to reconsider. Unless you can mimic its native habitat, the Darth Vader flower might prove a challenge for even seasoned gardeners. Number 13, Voodoo Lily, a Morphophallus konjac. Voodoo Lily plants are quite a spectacle with their massive flowers and unique leaves. But it's not just their looks that stand out, they've got a potent aroma, once again reminiscent of rotting meat. <laughs> Although this might not be everyone's cup of tea, it's a major hit with flies, the plant's primary pollinators. Don't get their otherworldly appearance fool you either. Growing these lilies ain't rocket science. Once you get the hang of planting a voodoo lily bulb, the rest is a breeze. And there's more to these little lilies than meets the eye. Their starchy tubers are even edible. Yeah, <laughs> sign me up. In some corners of the world, this plant doubles as a food source. Whether it's transformed into a neutral flower, crafted into a vegan-friendly jelly alternative, or used to whip up slippery shirataki noodles in Japan, the voodoo lily wears many chef's hats. And if you've ever enjoyed that popular fruit jelly snack in Asia, you've got this plant's starch to thank. A little botany 101, the voodoo lily belongs to the phylodendron family, Araceae. It sprouts a lone leaf from a tuber, and no, it's not a corm, despite what some might say. These tubers can grow impressively big, sometimes hitting the scales at 22 kilograms. As the leaf makes its grand entrance, the tuber size reduces, only to be replaced by a newer, more sizable tuber during the season. And let's not forget the leaf stalk, or petiole, with its intriguing mix of pinkish gray and olive green spots. The leaf itself is an art piece with a split three-way design, giving it that signature umbrella style. Number 12, Angel Orchid, Habenaria grandifloriformis. The angel orchid, also known as Habenaria grandifloriformis, is a standout orchid that calls the high-altitude grasslands of southern India home. Back in 1932, Charles McCann and Ethelbert Blatter were the first to talk about it in their writings. With its pristine, two-lobed petals, it's easy to see why some people think it resembles an angel in mid-flight. Typically, you'll see one to five flowering stems on a plant. Each stem, capped with a single flower, stands about 12 centimeters tall. They love to show off during the start of the monsoons, which is around June and July. Want to get your hands on one? <laughs> they might be a bit elusive, mainly because they're not commonly grown. As you can see, the beautiful white petals. But if you do snag one, they're often sold as tubers. For planting, bury them about 12 centimeters deep in spacious pots filled with well-draining soil. Here's a little DIY soil tip. Makes 50% river sand, 40% leaf mulch, and 10% vermiculite. Give them a good drink of water, place them in a cool shaded spot with plenty of fresh air. And during its growth, you'll most likely see a single heart-shaped leaf resting comfortably on the ground. Number 11, Dancing Girls, Impatience Bequerti. Impatience Bequerti, often dubbed the Dancing Girls due to their petals resembling playful girls in skirts, is a true gem among flowers. This unique bloom hails from the Impatience family Yet it stands out without a distinct species name. What went wrong here? Originating from the rainforests of East Africa, where temperatures tend to stay between a cozy 6 degrees Celsius and 26 degrees Celsius, these flowers typically show off in white. Sometimes, however, they might surprise you with a tint of light pink. The tiny button-like yellow spots on their petals further enhance their charm. And it's not just about the flowers. Their heart-shaped leaves, with tones of olive green and dark red, are a sight to behold, too. These plants are pretty compact, spanning about 30 centimeters in width with flowers that barely reach three centimeters. While many impatients come and go as annuals, these dancing girls are perennials, thriving especially indoors. If you're considering adding them to your space, they do well in smaller pots, blossoming all year round if shown some love. They're also a good fit for hanging baskets, giving them space to stretch and climb. Remember though, the impatience bequerti is quite the rare find, and exporting it remains off limits. But there's good news. If you're eager to grow your own, seeds are available at several online outlets. Number 10, parrot flower, impatience citicina. Impatience citicina, commonly referred to as the parrot flower or parrot balsam, caught the eye of botanist Joseph Dalton Hooker. No relation to the hooker flower, by the way. He wasn't the only one intrigued by its unique appearance, which many say resembles a flying cockatoo. Interestingly, a British official noted that it was often spotted in the Shan states, even more than in Thailand. 
The Royal Gardens got their hands on this flower's seeds in 1899, and the next year it showcased its beauty in full bloom. While the flower is a stunner, the plant itself, not so much. Most of the year, it's a bit of an unruly bush, boasting broad leaves and reaching heights of up to six feet. With its short bloom period in October and November, you're looking at this not-so-pretty sight for the better part of the year. But how does this flower spread its beauty? The pollination mystery is a topic of discussion. Some speculate bats or long-tongued birds are the pollinators, but there's no official word on that. If you're planning a visit, the Thailand tourism website gives a heads up. The parrot flower dazzles in full glory in October and November. And while the flower is the star of the show, make no mistake, for most of the year, it's just a towering leafy bush. Still, when those blooms appear, it's unmistakably reminiscent of its feathery namesake. Number nine, flying duck orchid, Kaliana major. The Kaliana Major, commonly known as the Large Duck Orchid, is a cute little orchid found mainly in the eastern and southern stretches of Australia. What sets it apart is that its flower strikingly resembles a duck taking flight. These flowers have a clever tactic. They lure in insects, especially male sawflies, and trick them into pollination, a process termed as pseudocopulation. It's a neat trick, with the orchid's beak trapping the insects and making them walk through pollen, ensuring the plant's propagation. Here, <laughs> here. This sneaky orchid graced an Australian postage stamp back in 1986. But its distinctiveness has placed it on Australia's vulnerable plants list. The twin threats of habitat loss and dwindling pollinators put it at risk. If you're an orchid enthusiast, you might wish to grow one of these, but there's a catch, you won't find them up for sale. And the best chance to see them is a trip to Australia. The reason is these orchids have a symbiotic relationship with a specific fungus found only in their native habitat, largely the eucalyptus woodlands of southern and eastern Australia. So for now, they remain an exclusive Australian gem. Number eight, swaddled babies, Anguloa uniflora. The world of orchids boasts a plethora of stunning flowers, but the Anguloa uniflora truly stands out. Affectionately nicknamed the swaddled babies orchid, its blooms resemble babies nestled in blankets. The journey to discover this gem was no small feat. Botanists Antonio Pavon Jimenez and Hippolito Ruiz Lopez embarked on a 10-year expedition from 1777 to 1788 across Chile and Peru. It wasn't until a decade after their discovery that the orchid received its official name in homage to the botanist Don Francisco de Angulo, a key figure in Peru's mining sector. The swaddled baby's orchid isn't particularly large, with the plant reaching heights of 45 to 60 centimeters. Peeking below its slender, pleated leaves, you'll spot cone-like pseudobulbs. However, its showstopper is undeniably the intricate flower, those swaddled infants. The blooms, sizable compared to the plant, often have cream or white hues with a waxy texture. As a bonus, they give off a pleasant scent. The orchid has also earned the nickname Tulip Orchid, the overlapping petals encasing the baby look just like those of a tulip. Number seven, laughing bumblebee orchid, Ophrys bumbleiflora. The bumblebee, the bumblebee orchid, can be found sprinkled across the Mediterranean, but it's a bit scarce as you move towards the east. However, if you're in the Algarve region of Portugal, these orchids are virtually everywhere. <laughs> They're hard to miss. Typically, the bumblebee orchid is on the shorter side but in areas with taller neighbors, it can stretch up to 35 centimeters in its quest for sunlight. Its flowers come with standout green, oval-shaped petals and smaller triangular petals that occasionally have a bronze shade. The lip of the flower has a brownish tone with three lobes, and sometimes there's a hint of blue in the speculum. Among the Ophrys species, this one's a breeze to identify making plant spotting a tad easier. What's super cool about this orchid is its dual survival tactic. While it does depend on insects for pollination, it's also a master at sprouting new plants from its root tubers. It's not the bumblebees that pollinate Ophrys bombiliflora, it's the male bees from the Eucera genus. <laughs> Those ones, just like the other Ophrys types, these orchids play a trick. They resemble and smell like female bees. The eager Early arriving males end up attempting to mate with these deceptive flowers. It's 
called pseudocopulation. <laughs> Collecting pollen in the process. This inadvertently ensures that the pollen reaches other flowers of the same species. Clever, right? Number six, the ice cream tulip. Ever heard of ice cream tulips? It's a tulip that mimics a scoop of vanilla ice cream nestled in a pink cone. The bottom petals are a rich pink, while the top petals are pristine white. Blooming in the late spring, these tulips don't demand any more care than your standard tulip. They pretty much look like a tantalizing duo of ice cream flavors, possibly vanilla and strawberry, hence the playful name, ice cream tulip. This variety is more compact with sturdy short stems that grow between 25 to 40 centimeters. Surrounding these stems are vibrant green leaves that grow densely. When you come across pictures of these tulips, you might do a double take, questioning if they're even real. It's nice. It's, it, it, I prefer a single tulip. My While tulips always have their distinct charm, breeders have come up with numerous fascinating variants. The ice cream tulip is legit. It's the brainchild of Vertuco BV, a flower breeding company, and it was introduced in 1999. Officially, it goes by the name Tulipa Ice Cream. The classic white and pink combo isn't the end of the line, though. For those who fancy a twist, there's also the Tulipa Ice Cream Banana with bright ice cream petals perched on a pink base. Number five, the flame lily, Gloriosa superba. Gloriosa superba is a unique species in the Gloriosa family, stemming from the autumn crocus bunch. While you might hear it being called various names like the glory lily, fire lily, or even tiger's claw, it stands out on its own. Originating from regions spanning tropical Africa to Asia, including places like China and India, this plant is pretty versatile. It thrives in temperate climates and is known to pop up as a summer bulb, even though it's not genuinely a lily. Lily is found throughout Africa and up into Asia. Speaking of its natural habitat, you'll spot it in various places, from forests and grasslands to even sand dunes with not so great soil. But this plant is no snack. It's rich in the toxic alkaloid, colchicine, especially in its tubers. Consuming it in large quantities can be fatal to both humans and animals. That said, it's been used in traditional medicine, but only in tiny doses. The Gloriosa superba is not just a plant, it's the national emblem of Zimbabwe. However, while it's celebrated in some parts, in regions like Australia and certain US areas, it's tagged as a pesky weed. Aesthetically, its flowers are mainly vibrant red or orange, but you might find variations in cream, yellow, or even purple red. Interestingly, these colors darken as they age, with the tepals taking on a wavy or curled appearance. In the wild, these beauties attract butterflies and sunbirds, leading to pollination. Once pollinated, they boast large fruits with around 20 red seeds, making them quite a sight to behold. Number four, the bat flower, Taca chantrieri. Taca chantrieri is a unique flowering plant that's part of the same family as yams, Dioscoraceae. You might have heard it called the black bat flower, and in French, it's known as the mustaches de tigre. Creative names in various languages hint at its beauty and unusual appearance. The name taka is inspired by the Indonesian term for these plants, taka. Across the family, you'll find two main types and around 13 species most native to Asia. They have a resemblance to yams, thanks to their tuberous roots, leading some people to confuse the two. Their large leaves spring straight from these roots and might even have some lobes, but the flowers are its most amazing feature. They sit on long stalks with expansive bracts that surround them, resembling wings. Dangling threads, bracteoles, hang alongside, giving it that cat whiskers look. The actual flowers nestled in the middle are probably the least attention-grabbing part. People enjoy the young leaves either grilled or raw, paired with a tangy sauce. They pack a slightly bitter flavor, but are believed to be strength boosters. Historically, the starchy tubers were fermented to produce alcohol. Nowadays, their traditional medicine research center has this plant on their radar for its potential in herbal medicine. In some Aka communities, a drink made from the rhizome is prescribed for anemia or as a natural aphrodisiac. Number three, Purple Morning Glory, Ipomoea purpurea. Morning Glory, scientifically known as Ipomoea purpurea, belongs to the Convolvulaceae family. Originally from Mexico and Central America, this beauty has made its way to gardens worldwide. Recognizable by its bright heart-shaped leaves and vibrant purple-blue trumpet flowers, it's a sight to behold. These flowers, ranging from 5 to 17 centimeters, open up in the morning to reveal their white centers, but by afternoon they're usually closed up, hence their name, Morning Glory. What's neat about the plant is its daily flower show. 
From early summer to early fall, it's always dressed in fresh blooms. And in just one season, this annual vine can shoot up to heights between two to three meters and span one to two meters feet wide. If you've got a fence, wall, or arbor, Morning Glory is ready to climb. It's not picky though. Pots, hanging boxes, and even as ground cover. It is on the front side of the house. It fits right in, especially in cottage gardens or Mediterranean themed spaces. Need to spruce up or cover an unsightly spot? This plant's speedy growth has got you covered. The seeds contain a chemical called ergine, which isn't too friendly if ingested. It's a good idea to keep the plants away from curious pets or kids, and if you're handling them, maybe pop on some gloves for safety's sake. Number two, hanging lobster claw flower, Helioconia rostrata. Helioconias might remind you of the popular bird of paradise flower, Strelitzia reginae. While they aren't as famous, they definitely deserve some spotlight. Not only are their flowers a sight to behold, but their leaves add to their overall appeal too. Take the Helioconia rostrata, for instance, commonly known as the hanging lobster claw. This big guy can grow up to two to three meters tall. Unlike its Helioconia siblings, whose flowers stand tall, the rostrata's bloom dangles downward. Mature plants can even sport inflorescences over a meter long, but the actual flowers aren't the best part even. Instead, it's the vibrant, leathery bracts that protect them from the rain. The thing about their cultures is they do like it warm. They're not plant. These bracts are a vivid red with striking yellow edges, and the leaves shoot straight up, resembling those of banana plants but with a tougher texture. The plant sprouts from an underground rhizome, growing firm and straight. It's a pretty low-maintenance plant, thriving with just ample space and light. In their natural tropical habitat, helioconias have a special relationship with hummingbirds. They're the only ones that can pollinate them. To attract these speedy little birds, helioconias flaunt their bright red and orange bracts and produce tube-like structures filled with sweet nectar. It's fascinating to think that these birds, which can flap their wings between 10 to 80 times per second, rely on such a unique plant for sustenance. Number one, Persian carpet flower, Edith Colia grandis. Edith Colia grandis is a unique succulent plant. Unlike others, it's got branched roots without any leaves. What's really eye-catching, though, are its pale yellow flowers with hints of reddish brown. Watch out for the stems. They come with sharp teeth, boast four or five angles, and showcase colors ranging from gray-green to red with dark spots. These stems can grow up to 30 centimeters long and about three centimeters wide. The large, hairy-edged flowers can span up to 12 centimeters and blossom right at the stem's tip. And those winged seeds are neatly anchored by two seed horns, or follicles. Smell of something dead. Um, this actually smells more like... Ever heard of the Persian carpet flower? That's another name for this plant. People in arid regions worldwide sometimes grow it for this ornamental value, but it's a bit tricky to care for. It craves ample light and prefers winter temperatures to be above 15 degrees Celsius. Thinking about adding it to your garden? This bloomer lights up in the spring with its lovely pale yellow flowers. It's an excellent conversation starter, especially if you plant it in an attractive pot. Remember, Succulents like Edith Colia Grandis need their fair share of sunshine. Ensure it gets a sunny spot, preferably outdoors, because it flourishes best in full to partly sunny locations. Indoor growing, maybe not its favorite place to be. What's your favorite unusual plant or flower? Would you want to try growing any of these in your garden? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right 